the internet has changed the world as we know it. But up until now, it has been search, share, and shop. And then along comes Mark Pincus. I kept saying, it was like a mantra, I was like, I want to be the biggest macro bet on social gaming. I want to be the one who believes in it more, believes in play more, and invests more in that than anyone else. Mark Pincus' big bet turned addictive games into a multi-billion dollar empire. But success didn't come easily. Mark said something to the effect of, you know, it's no fun to come in in the morning when we're losing. Or quickly. I joke to people that I was kind of like the 41-year-old pitcher for the Yankees who's still walking out to the mound. I'm 41, and I'm back to what I was doing when I was 28. The journeyman of internet startups finally found his perfect pitch. The most popular maker of games on Facebook may raise up to $1 billion in its IPO. Isn't it incredible? Until the playing field shifted beneath him. We had a period when everything was going right, and there was no reason to believe it was going to stop. What's happened has been terrible. I mean, their business has essentially collapsed in the space of a few months. As Zynga hits its sixth year, the hard-driving, competitive CEO is even more determined to stay in the game. I think that the truth is written over a long period of time. You know, I'm in this for the long run, and I'm looking for other people who are, too. In the Silicon Valley version of Mafia Wars, Mark Pincus would be the godfather. Uh, Mark Pincus' biggest curse is that some people in the first one second don't like him. He moves too fast for many people. He used to have this habit of like getting up on his chair, almost attacking you with his ideas. I was after this dream of starting an internet treasure. An internet treasure is a service that you can't remember life before and you can't imagine life without. Pincus has been treasure hunting since childhood, when games were still played around his family table in Chicago's Lincoln Park neighborhood. Pincus's mother, Donna, was an architect. Mark was the middle child and also the only boy. So it was rather competitive between the three of them but he always did things his own way. Pincus described his father, Ted, who ran a respected public relations firm, as a rule breaker. I thought the one word that most defined him was chutzpah, and the Yiddish definition basically said a leader, um, and said someone who, you know, can change the rules. There's something I got from my father, that if you're gonna do something, really go for it, be all in, don't compromise. It's a lesson that has stayed with him. After graduating from University of Pennsylvania's Wharton School of Business, Pincus worked as a financial analyst in New York before going to Harvard for an MBA. He moved to Washington, D.C. and found himself at a career crossroads. I woke up in the middle of the night. This is 1994, and I couldn't sleep. Keeping him awake was the introduction of the world's first Internet browser. Mosaic Communications had just come out, and spent the whole rest of the night writing this essay about what if the future looks like this? And I said, what if Mosaic Communications displaces Microsoft and becomes the next major platform for the world? Pincus says that essay earned him an interview with Fred Wilson, a young venture capitalist looking for ideas. Fred said, I'll tell you what, if you want to pursue uh, one of those ideas, we'll loan you $250,000 for four months. So it's a demand note. And at that time, that was a really risky thing to do. Pincus took the money and ran with it, becoming the president and COO of a web startup called Freeloader. The idea with Freeloader was to create a, a toolbar that attached to your browser that let you subscribe to any content you liked on the Internet. The content downloaded while you were sleeping, something Pincus and co-founder Sunil Paul weren't doing a lot of. It, it was definitely the hardest in terms of number of hours that I've ever worked on a, on a startup. It was so hard, it was unsustainable. I mean, you can't work seven days a week, more or less continuously, uh, forever. So we had four months to get a product in the market, prove that it was viable, and raise venture capital money or bring in enough revenues to support ourselves. But this was our shot, and, and we were very aware of that. Every day was numbered. The demanding schedule paid off. In June 1996, 
the young entrepreneurs sold Freeloader to Individual Inc. for $38 million, mostly in company stock. According to the Washington Post, the payday for 30-year-old Pincus was a hefty $7.5 million. And I said, well, so now are you going to retire? I mean, why would you keep working? And he said, well, why would I retire? It's what I do. You know, it's who I am. Newly partnered with Individual Inc., Pincus packed up and moved the freeloader team to San Francisco. But their fortunes turned when management problems tore apart the parent company. And within a year, Freeloader was finished. The CEO left, kind of imploded. Here's Sunil and I, we're 28, 29 years old. We're the biggest shareholders in this company. And they, they don't let us pursue our vision, which was the whole reason that we joined up with the company in the first place. It was painful stagnation for both of us. With his company Freeloader shut down, a restless and determined Mark Pincus started a new company called Support.com. It was a service that would remotely diagnose and fix computer problems. So imagine in the middle of the dot-com and the consumer explosion, I'm building the most boring enterprise software company, you know, the world has ever seen. I couldn't get my venture capitalists even interested in it. They, they asked me if I could cut meetings short, you know, when I went in to present to them. It wasn't interesting, it wasn't my vision of an internet treasure, but it was on the way. Pincus soon clashed with those investors who forced him to step down as CEO, but he remained chairman of the board. I would say, you know, was a disruptor. If I disagreed, challenged, I would challenge the board, the whole company, if I believed that we we're going the wrong direction. And I think what I realized from then to now is that it's not just about being a strong entrepreneur and a strong product maker, but you have to be a strong CEO and leader, and you have to be a person that people want to follow. The guy everyone in the Valley was following happened to be a former intern at Freeloader, Sean Parker. Parker had co-founded a new startup that was becoming the hottest network on the Internet. Napster, for me, was the beginning of the social web that, that we are now all using today. It said four and a half million people are connected right now, and that had meaning to you because it was the first time that you looked at your computer and you looked across the Internet at other people. He met someone who agreed. Serial startup investor and then PayPal executive Reed Hoffman. Mark and I realized that we had certain kind of kinship of how we were thinking about the Internet, kind of like a power to the people, and that the projects that most interested us were massive scale. We both invested in Friendster without even knowing it, and we started hanging out and, and trading notes. Friendster took off like a rocket. Millions signed up for the new social network. Pincus wanted to take it one step further. He teamed up with Paul Martino, now managing director of Bullpen Capital, to start a social networking site of his own, Tribe.net. Mark spotted how important Friendster was, maybe even before the CEO did. I remember the sentence he said to me, he says, Paul, don't you understand? This will change the way we do everything online. And I said, I think we're at another one of those changing points where this whole internet world might be reinvented in a social context. Local listings and Craigslist. But Tribe.net wasn't Craigslist or Friendster. Among its problems, it was overwhelmed by devotees of Burning Man, the annual festival held in the Nevada desert. Vanessa Gregoriadis wrote a profile in Pincus for Vanity Fair magazine. Mark is, is a huge supporter of Burning Man. Burning Man is a very inclusive community. You know, it's about like going to the desert and kind of letting your inner freak out. But I don't think he really thought that, you know, that should cross over necessarily to his business model. But some people were sharing a little too much. You know, naked guys were sending pictures of themselves. So I think he recognized that that didn't really work. Tribe.net was soon withering and losing money. For Pincus, the party was over. Mark said something to the effect of, you know, it's no fun to come in in the morning when we're losing. You know, there were other social networks that launched after us that were bigger. When we saw the number of people online at that point on MySpace, we thought this can't be true. I think we had a lot of self-doubt. Um, and 
and we couldn't figure out how we'd gotten it so wrong. And it was confusing, and I went through lots of questioning. It was his third startup to fall short of his great expectations. Pincus was disillusioned and rudderless. Bing Gordon is a partner with Kleiner, Perkins, Caulfield, and Byers, and a Zynga board member. Yeah, he went away kind of exploring meaning of life and by chance came across Tony Robbins. The message that he took away was most people give themselves permission to fail. They didn't want to give himself the right to fail. Some of his sound bites still resonate in my head. Like, we can write our own stories. And what story do you want to write? And the whole idea of owning your own destiny and outcome and not being a victim, no excuses. With nothing but time on his hands, Pink has spent hours playing the online game Rise of Nations. I would go online to play, and within minutes, these kids were attacking me with nuclear missiles and tanks, and I was throwing spears at them. And I was so frustrated, and I spent hours, and I think it tanked a relationship in my life. It was not healthy. But I, you get a, you get like addicted and obsessed. And I know you should just put the game down. And I, I couldn't. And he thought, God, you know, how do I beat these guys? You know, I would really pay a lot of money just to get to the next level here. So that started him thinking about, you know, how exactly would money interact in a normal game? The king of social media then made an announcement that would change Pincus's life. We're here to unveil the next evolution of Facebook platform. Any developer worldwide is going to be able to build full applications on top of the social graph inside of the Facebook framework. My first light bulb moment was then, and I said, wow, I could offer games as kind of an always on way for people to socialize, and I don't have to build a social network. And I mean, it's like poker. I have to admit that I kind of thought he was a little nuts. I wasn't convinced that it was a genius idea, let's put it that way. For Mark Pincus, the fourth attempt at a tech startup was the charm. He had finally hit on his big idea. He named it after his beloved American bulldog, Zynga. The first hand dealt by the new game company was a classic, Texas Hold'em. And we literally wondered, is anyone going to play? We were in the rooms to start with because we thought they shouldn't be empty. And then we just saw the viral nature of people inviting each other to the game take off. Mark kept going online and saying, oh my god, there's a hundred people playing, playing Texas Hold'em. And then there was like a thousand people. I mean, it was, it just snowballed. You take this desire I'd had my whole career to create something long-term meaningful that was one of these verbs in our life, and now I had play. Oh my God, play. That's as good as search. The game was free. Revenue came from ads for other Facebook applications. Pincus moved urgently to grow the company. I kept saying, it was like a mantra, I was like, I want to be the biggest macro bet on social gaming. I want to be the one who believes in it more, believes in play more, and invests more in that than anyone else. Worried his own funds weren't enough to keep up, Pincus looked for outside investors with a condition. I was very upfront with investors that I was building this company only for the long term. We were never going to sell the company. I was going to be a controlling uh, shareholder and board member and an equal partner with my investors. John Doerr is a legendary venture capitalist with Kleiner, Perkins, Caulfield and Byers. Doerr was interested in Zynga, but knew about Pincus's uncompromising reputation. Someone was trying to do some checking on Mark and came back with the report that he wasn't the kind of entrepreneur that Kleiner Perkins would back. I smarted off, well, maybe we better change what the kind of entrepreneur is who, who we would back. A group of investors led by Kleiner Perkins gave the sprouting Zynga a $29 million injection of cash. But Zynga's next hit, Mafia Wars, came under attack when the creator of the game Mob Wars sued for copyright infringement. Dean Takahashi is lead games writer for the tech news website VentureBeat. The game design was, was very similar to another Mafia game uh, created by a fellow named Dave Maestri. He, you know, rightly pointed out that almost every aspect of the Zynga game was similar to something that he had already done. Zynga settled the lawsuit for an undisclosed amount. 
The accusations continued when Zynga released Farmville. It looked a lot like Farm Town, released by game company Slashkey months earlier. Zynga very quickly turned around and duplicated this game, and it got tens of millions of more users because it had done the social layer right. Pincus disputed the copycat charge, claiming game mechanics were not copyright protected, and millions of users were also attracted to another feature of Zynga games, virtual goods. He believed other gamers, like him, would be willing to pay to get ahead. Doug McMillan covers Pincus for Bloomberg News and Businessweek. In Farmville, you get your own plot of land, and you can make your own character, and you can buy different things to put on that farm, like a fence or a cow or a tractor. And it's all about decorating and expressing yourself. And ultimately, for Zynga, the cash cow here is the items that you can buy to put on that farm. That cash cow was pushing Zynga into becoming the biggest online game operator in the United States. But then, Pincus faced a new controversy. The Silicon Valley blog TechCrunch released a 2009 video of Pincus speaking to a group of budding entrepreneurs. So, so I, I funded the company myself, but I did every horrible thing in the book to just get revenues right away. Mark's comment that he did every horrible thing in the book was probably the biggest mistake that he's made in his career. He kind of put himself at odds with the whole ethos of Silicon Valley, which is build a great product first and then figure out how to make money on it. Um, so control your destiny, that was a big lesson. If you hear the whole talk, I was really trying to make a point to them about consumer internet companies can have revenues and be profitable, and they're not just about eyeballs and all the things that were horrible about the dot-com bubble. I'm sorry I said it because I think it didn't just throw me under a bus, it threw the, the innovation and, and so much about what, our, what Zynga's done under a bus. Zynga owed its phenomenal growth in large part to Facebook, which provided over 90% of its revenue. Ads for Zynga were popping up like weeds on Facebook. But not all users wanted to be farmers or mobsters. The non-gaming players on Facebook started complaining, saying, can you put a stop to this? So Facebook uh, did, uh, and Zynga lost tens of millions of users. Facebook's founder, Mark Zuckerberg, was also looking for a bigger cut of the hundreds of millions of dollars being hauled in by Zynga. Money Zynga didn't want to give up. With that much at stake, the standoff turned into a Silicon Valley version of Mafia Wars. Kleiner Perkins venture capitalist John Doerr found himself in the middle. There was a, a deep disagreement between uh, Facebook and Zynga, and Mark wanted some advice on how to handle it. I went up and met with Mark and his team and then said, well, let's talk to Facebook about this. No company had ever done what Facebook had done before. Facebook, with nothing more than an online click-through agreement, opened up their entire network of users to any company in the world. And also, no company had ever done what we had done, which is grow the size business and the size footprint of users on top of an agreement like that. The two companies didn't even have a one-page legal agreement between us. Pincus had more at risk. Losing Facebook as a platform could have meant the end of Zynga. I encouraged the two companies to uh, look for a common ground, which they found, and then to sustain their relationship. The two companies faced a real decision whether or not we were going to double down on each other or diversify away. Mark Zuckerberg isn't a normal CEO, and he's really kind of courageous and visionary. We wanted to make something else work. We both saw that it was in our users' interest to double down together. Zuckerberg and Pincus announced a five-year strategic relationship. Zynga agreed to a 30% tax on virtual products it sold through Facebook. With the crisis averted, Zynga went on a spending spree. In late 2010, they acquired the company New Toy and their Words with Friends franchise for $53 million. By the end of 2011, the company was getting too big to remain private. Just before Zynga's initial public offering, 
the New York Times reported that some company employees were grumbling about the demanding work environment. Pincus had heard it all before. I think Mark doesn't suffer fools. DreamWorks Animation CEO Jeffrey Katzenberg sits on Zynga's board of directors. And it's as simple as that. And what he has is a very high regard and admiration for smart, talented people who deliver. And if you are not that, then he doesn't have a lot of patience. So maybe that's why we're buddies. <laughs> Zynga's IPO said to be the biggest U.S. web one since Google. Zynga went public in December 2011 with a $7 billion valuation and with Pincus retaining unprecedented voting power. But Pincus couldn't control what happened next. Its first quarter earnings report uh, in 2012 um, showed that the company was spending more and more on R&D and spending more and more for each game that it was putting out um, and users were not staying. In fact, it was saying to, to investors that a majority of its growth was coming in mobile games, uh, which was not where it was spending a majority of its R&D dollars. The growth on the web slowed down. You know, it kind of stalled. The transition to mobile um, surprised us as it seems to be surprising the whole world. Eight months after its initial public offering, the company had lost over 70% of its value. And there was more bad news to come. Another top executive is leaving Zynga. Several key executives left, and the company was hit with lawsuits for copyright infringement and insider trading. And the fragile relationship between Facebook and Zynga showed signs of unraveling. Its next big fall came um, in the wake of Facebook's um, IPO. Zynga relies almost exclusively on Facebook um, for, its, uh, for its revenue, and Facebook's IPO was a big fizzle. That, in turn, dragged Zynga down along with it. Zynga just cut its earnings forecast for both the third quarter and the full year. Quote, the third quarter of 2012 continued to be challenging, and while many of our games performed as planned, as a whole, we did not execute to our satisfaction, end quote. Despite the stunning decline, Pincus doubled down, announcing plans for new games, a focus on mobile, and a move into real money gaming. He and his wife, Allison, live on San Francisco's Gold Coast with their twin daughters. Allison is also a successful entrepreneur who runs a high-end home decor website. Mark always had a passion. He always wanted to be like Google now and Amazon. And I think for Mark, it's very important that Zynga is right up there with all of them. I think that the truth is written over a long period of time. You know, I'm in this for the long run, and I'm looking for other people who are, too.